I was amazed to realise that during the mid-19th century, Peterhead was the premier whaling port, with 31 ships leaving her harbour in 1857, half of Britain's whaling fleet. I kept coming across the same names associated with Peterhead's whaling and sealing Haiti. Alexander Geary, William Vollum, William Penny, and not forgetting the Greys, to name but a few. Owing to our whaling industry, there are places in America and Canada named after Peterhead folk. From Labrador on Canada's east coast to the extreme western part of the Yukon, names such as Penny Sound, Grey Strait and Eclipse Harbour, named after Captain Grey's renowned whaler ship, are to be found. Similarly, in the north of Greenland, Milne Land is named after Captain Milne. Although largely unpopulated, Milne Land is now a growing tourist area offering kayaking and snowmobile holidays. During the 1800s, whale ships made a total of 2,300 voyages to the Davis Straits whaling region. More than 92% of these were made by British vessels. The Peterhead whalers were after the bowhead whale, more commonly named the Greenland right whale. Bowheads are among the longest living mammals on earth. They can live to be over 200 years old. They're very large, up to 80 feet in length, 30 feet round the middle, their skin 5 to 7 millimetres thick and weighing about 60 tonnes. Slow swimmers and docile, they stay close to the ice as they have no natural enemies. But over a hundred years ago, they were hunted to near extinction. In the 1650s, it was calculated that there were about 60,000 bowhead whales. Today, there are fewer than 500. Conveniently for the hunter, they floated on the surface when killed, and most importantly of all, provided a profitable yield of whale bone and oil. The bowheads were found only on their migrating routes in largely uncharted Arctic waters. Nature was the whale's only defence, and she pushed whaling captains and their crews to the limits of human endurance. When hunters approached a whale, always from behind, silence was essential. The harpoon, with its coil of rope attached, had to be delivered within a distance of a few yards. The moment the wounded whale disappeared from sight, a flag was hoisted in the boat to give notice that assistance was required from the ship. Paying attention to the line was of the utmost importance. If the line became entangled, the boat would be drawn underwater by the whale and the crew possibly lost. Sometimes its motion was restricted by one or more turns of the line round a bollard fixed in the boat for this purpose. The friction could be so great that quantities of smoke were produced. Consequently, the bollard had to be sluiced with water to prevent a fire from breaking out. Even with the bollard's assistance, the whale line might run out within 10 minutes. Then the lines of a second or even a third boat would be attached, resulting in as much as 600 or 700 fathoms of line. When first wounded, the whale commonly remained underwater for about 40 minutes, although a period of an hour was not unheard of. On rising after its second ascent, the whale was attacked with lances thrust deep into its body and aimed at its vital parts. Torrents of blood spouting from the blowhole of the whale indicated that the end of the struggle was nigh. As soon as the whale was dead, no time was lost in piercing its tail or flukes, securing the carcass to the boats by means of a cable, and then towing it towards the ship. A whale hunt could last from 15 minutes for up to 50.
50 hours. So how did the Peterhead whalers extract those precious commodities of whalebone and oil from such an enormous and heavy mammal? Strong tackles were placed at the nose and tail of the whale's huge carcass. A combination of powerful blocks was attached to a band of blubber known as the Kent, two or three feet wide and encircling the whale's neck. Section by section, the whole circumference of the mammal was raised to the surface. The harpooners had spikes on their footwear to prevent them falling off from the carcass. With a spade and huge knives, they made long parallel cuts from end to end, which were divided by cross cuts into pieces of blubber weighing about half a ton each. These were conveyed on deck, and after being reduced to smaller portions, were stowed in the hold. The blubber was later put into barrels, a process called making off. The baleen or whalebone from the whale's upper jaw was then detached by means of hand spikes, knives and spades, all made from bone. It was split by bone wedges into portions containing five or ten blades each, then stowed away. Only the huge carcass of flesh and bone called the kreng was left in the sea, a vital food supply for birds, sharks and bears. Later it was discovered that ground bone could be used as fertiliser for farmers. On arrival at Peterhead South Harbour, the whalers unloaded the barrels of blubber at a jetty, still known today as Blubber Box Key. From there, the blubber was carted to the boil yards, where batches weighing several tonnes were boiled over a furnace for many hours in copper vessels called tripods. The oil that separated out was run off into cooling tanks, returned to the barrels and then sold. Whale oil was in high demand for lighting lamps. It was later used in the manufacture of ice cream, margarine, cosmetics and of course the textile industry, particularly the Dundee jute mills. During the First World War, Logie Baird patented socks soaked in whale oil to try to combat foot rot in the trenches. Glycerol was added to boiled whale oil to produce soap, and when nitro was added to glycerol, explosives were created. Whales were also prized for their baleen or whalebone. This flexible horny substance, which hangs in plates from the upper jaws of certain whales, was used in numerous ways for fishing rods and nets, riding crops, brushes, window blinds, upholstery stuffing, carriage springs, luggage, and especially in ladies' fashion, for example in dress hoops, umbrella ribs, and corset stays. The female guests at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897 wore dresses with corset stays cut from whalebone, wholesaling at over £2,000 per tonne. Captains often brought back parts of the whale skeletons as trophies, especially the lower jaws which they hung from the ship rigging. Consequently, many relics of the whaling industry survive in Peterhead today. If you take a stroll along Pleasure Walk on Peterhead's Keith Inch, you'll see an imprint of a whale's lower jaw arched in the granite wall. What of the ships that sailed in the treacherous Arctic waters? Peterhead's first whaling ship was called the Robert. Built in Hull, she was a comparatively small ship capable of carrying a crew of between 26 and 36 men, including master, mate and doctor. In 1788, a Peterhead firm purchased her for the prosecution of the whale fisheries and thus introduced whaling to Peterhead. This marked the beginning of a new era in the history of the town and its harbours. For 14 years, the Robert was the only Peterhead vessel bound for the Arctic. And during her first four seasons, she caught only three whales. Two of the partners in the firm, 
James Arbuthnot Sr. and John Hutchison, both members of prominent families in the town and with other fishing interests, decided to appoint a new captain. Under the command of Captain Peacock from Hull, catches improved significantly and the Robert brought home a respectable 1,300 seals. But still, the profits were not high. James Arbuthnot and John Hutchison made a last-minute attempt to save their investment. They suggested that the ship be put in the hands of a local with a more diligent skipper and crew. In 1798, Sandy Geary, a sailor's son from the old Roanheads, was promoted to captain. He had served on the Robert as a mate since her earliest days and was the best harpooner aboard her. John Souter, also a local man, went as mate. This brought a sudden change of fortune. On her first trip under Geary, the Robert took eight whales and brought home more than 70 tonnes of oil worth £2,000, a fortune in those days. Over the next four years, she brought home a total of 27 whales. Owing to the success, a bigger ship called the Hope replaced the Robert in 1802. Just two years later, she was joined by the Enterprise, and from 1810 until 1820, a new vessel joined the whaling fleet yearly. By 1837, seal fishing was regarded as profitable, and by the 1840s, Peterhead had superseded Hull as the principal whaling port in Great Britain. For 40 years, Peterhead Harbour was the acknowledged headquarters for the Arctic whaling fishery. By 1853, whaling in Peterhead was booming, and there were at least 12 companies operating here. But the whales were becoming noticeably scarce. Of the 27 ships that sailed from Peterhead in 1853, only 12 took any whales and the following year only 10 fish were taken. But in 1856, just two years later, fortunes were made when the Peterhead fleet caught 70 whales and 42,000 seals. By then, the graving dock in Peterhead had been built specifically for our Greenland whalers at a cost of £6,000. Steam power was introduced. Peterhead even had two steam vessels built, the Inuit in 1857 and the Empress of India in 1859. Tragically, both were lost in 1859. The ice was just too powerful for the steel hulls and crushed them, popping out their rivets. Wooden ships were discovered to be more pliable and bended under the pressure of the ice. Shipbuilders combined wooden ships with steam power. Dundee shipbuilders, who had in fact developed this design, went from strength to strength, and in the late 1850s, Dundee overtook Peterhead and the whaling stakes for the first time. 1857 marked the beginning of the Peterhead whaling industry's slow and relentless decline. By the late 1870s, you could count the number of Peterhead whalers on one hand. The Eclipse and the Hope, under the command of Captain David Gray and his brother Captain John Gray, respectively, were the only regular vessels of the Peterhead fleet. On one of these voyages, a young medical student called Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, was employed as the ship's doctor on the Hope. In 1890, no whales were caught by any British ship in the Arctic. The following year, Captain David Gray made his last voyage on the Eclipse. She was sold to Dundee in 1892. The following year, he came out of retirement and, along with his brothers, commanded the last fleet of whalers sailing out of Peterhead for the Arctic. He sailed the famous Windward but brought home only one whale. 
During his 43 years as a whaling captain, he had taken almost 200 whales and 170,000 seals. Some of his donations, including Eskimo weapons and Mochi, the polar bear, are on display today at the Arbuthnot Museum. 1893 was the last year that whale ships set sail from Peterhead Harbour and brought back catches of whales or seals from the Arctic. Peterhead's once thriving whaling industry had lasted for little over 100 years. Only three generations had plied the industry. Captain Alexander Geary had commanded the first Peterhead whaler and his grandson, Captain David Gray, the last. Peterhead's links with the Arctic continued for another 30 years until after the First World War, when the town took part in the lucrative cryolite mineral trade. The sturdy Peterhead whalers were ideally suited to smash through fields of ice to reach the loading stations on the coast of Greenland. They then carried the ore from Greenland to ports in Britain, North America and Europe, while other retired whaling ships brought back blocks of ice from the Arctic for use in Victorian ice houses, or even took part in the Baltic timber trade. But these are stories for another day. <laughs>